All right, so we've got the exams and the practicals. So I'll pass those back. Um, I'll have to publish the grades on GradeScope. So that way you can see the multiple choice answers. Um, and then what I did on <clears throat> Blackboard, I included the grade for the multiple choice and multiple answers and then the grade for parts three through five, and then another column that is your exam one total grade. Uh, so that, that'll be on Blackboard. Um, you'll get this back, you can keep it. I posted the keys outside my office. Uh, check, uh, look, over, look over your exam, check that I, that I made, that I did the uh, additions or subtractions correctly. So calculated your grade correctly. If you have a question, uh, feel free to, to ask about it. Uh, I do say if you have a question about uh, why you, you got something wrong, uh, what you need to do is look in your notes, um, find where, <clears throat> instead of saying, I don't think this should be wrong, you have to provide an explanation as to why you don't think it should be wrong. So provide, you know, hey, in this slide, you know, on this presentation, you said this, that's what I marked, but you marked it wrong, uh, and I'll look at it. Um, nice thing is, is that I, I have the first page, so I have multiple choice, multiple answer. So if someone catches a mistake th that I made, um, that's probably a mistake on everyone's exam. So what I'll do is fix those and adjust the grades, and I'll let you know if that happens. Um, I did note, you know, some questions where, you know, not a whole lot of people were getting it correct. So I go back and look at the question and make sure that it's still, you know, that I marked the key correctly and that the notes support it. Uh, so I, I did do some of those checks, but hey, mistakes will happen. So uh, if you have questions, feel free to ask. Um, on the lab practical, uh, you'll just have the answer key. Uh, I'd have to go back and look at specific questions. There were some common ones that were wrong. A uh, couple questions I asked for the function, and some of you gave me actually the ID of that of that structure. And so that's I'm gonna say it's a silly mistake happens. Um, other one would, would be I asked for a class and gave me a subclass. So on, on those three slides in the back where I asked you to identify, uh, I said they all belong to the same class. Um, I had several people say Digenea. That's the subclass. It's class Trematoda. So again, I'd say it's probably a silly mistake, but it's still a mistake. All right, so you'll get those back. Uh, overall, they, I'd say they, they, weren't, they weren't too bad. First exam, kind of have an idea of what I'm doing. That's better. Uh, kind of have an idea of question types and so forth. And this will be the format of, of our exams moving forward. So the, Comment the disease names, you know, common name, give me the species name. That's going to be on the exam. Uh, the diagnosis will be on the exam. Life cycles will be on the exam. All right. And that includes the final exam, too. So if you made your a study guide and put, okay, here's the species name and the different disease names that go along with it, save it. Just add on to it. All right, so the other thing, we finished that nematode introduction. Uh, I posted the quiz, I put a due date on Friday, Friday night. So review the nematode stuff, review definitions, kind of know the definitions. Uh, we do introduce quite a few new terms. I almost have to, we're in a new phylum, uh, and that'll be pretty consistent anytime we switch, switch the phylum, uh, switch phylum. Any questions? All right, so we are on invert, the nematode diversity in vertebrate hosts. Uh, 
so it was the life cycles. So what, what I did was kind of break it down the life cycles. And, and the first one we're going to look at are these nematodes that utilize uh, invertebrates as their definitive host. So the first family we're going to talk about are uh, Steiner nematidae. Uh, this is in the order Rhabdidida, which is actually a fairly large order. You're going to see Rhabdidida basically includes all the families that we talk about later on. Well, not all of them. A large portion of, of the nematodes that we'll, that we'll discuss later on. All right, members in this family are entomopathogenic, uh, which means they infect your insects. Uh, and several of these, Steiner nema uh, especially, is used in, as a biological control agent. So I don't know if you, you're into gardening uh, or just like to look through gardening cat catalogs or whatever, or if you've heard, but sometimes you could, you could order nematodes to treat insect pests. Steiner nematidae, that's what, that's what you get. It's not much, I mean, I've never bought them, but I could imagine it's in like a little pill capsule that you just kind of sprinkle around. That's what I imagine, all right? So the infective stage in, in this family is a J3, it's called a J3 dower larva. All right, dower larva are not unique to this family. Dower larva are unique to the nematodes. What this larval stage is, is uh, a resting stage in our nematodes, all right? The juvenile nematode in which development is arrested because of unsuitable conditions. So we can grow nematodes. One of the model organisms um, that you know a lot of people research is uh, is a nematode. It is who knows it. Uh, drawing the blank on it. Anybody? Popular. Oh yeah. Cenorhabditis elegans, C. elegans. has like a massive, well, hold on. fruit flies have a massive book on just their genome. <laughs> and yeah, same thing with C. elegans. But C. elegans forms this, this dower larvae. So we know, we know a lot about it from that, that model organism. You grow them up, you can raise them on a petri dish with auger, with a nutrient auger. Real simple, real simple. All right? So it's, a, it's developmental arrest, which I say is a form of hypobiosis, which you may have encountered that term in intro biology class. I know if you took ecology, I know we, we covered it. All right, its function uh, is, is really to increase the infectivity window. It increases the amount of time that it could remain out in the environment and still remain infected to that next host. Benefit of this is that we, we kind of formless during times of harsher conditions. So for the C. elegans, we can change the conditions enough to stimulate formation of these dower larvae, no problem. All right, and the same thing applies here in Steiner, ne uh, Steiner Nema, where conditions become unfavorable, they form the dower larva, uh, and it, they're basically waiting things out, hoping to get picked up by the next host. So a dower larva, also called a dower juvenile, but this is at the J3 stage, and, and they usually are at the J3 stage. All right, members of this family possess a symbiotic bacteria in the gut. All right, this is a form of mutualism, and it they and, and it's mutualistic because the bacteria will will be a food source for the nematode. All right, but then the nematode itself is serving as a vector for the bacteria. So these are not free living bacteria. These are bacteria that have to be inside another organism. They get there by way of the nematode. All right? Questions? All right, so the example is Steiner Nema. Uh, Steiner Nema, it's out there. I'm sure we could probably find it around, around this area. Uh, the bacteria symbi symbiont is uh, Xenorhabdis. It's a species of Xenorhabdis. There's numerous ones. All right. Uh, I'm just going to refer to it as bacteria. All right. I'm not going to ask you, what's the bacteria? Because, man, if you, who's had microbiology? How many names of bacteria are there? Loads, right? We're not, this isn't microbiology. You don't have to know the name. 
So uh, I do have diagrams of the life cycle stages, but what we're going to do is talk about the life cycle. Holy cow, somebody did not erase this board. So what is this? Muscles. What class? Anatomy? Possibly? What kind of muscle? Basic muscle type. What type of muscle? Looks like skeletal. How do you know? Yeah, striations. Uh, what, have? what are these things? They're like motor neurons. Somebody used a lot of chalk to draw this. <laughs> Coming from the person that's almost emptied their chalk. But to be fair, I have two classes that use this, this chalk. All right, Steiner Nemo. Oh, by the way, we have a um, job candidate coming in. I think they arrived today. Um, they're teaching demonstrations 9 o'clock in CAB 100 tomorrow. So 9 o'clock tomorrow. And then I believe 115 in CAB 200 is the research talk. So... If you're available and can join, that'd be awesome. Let's increase the size of this. All right. Steiner Nemo. All right. Where are we going to start? Start over here. All right, we're going to start at the Dower J3 level because this will be out in the environment. So we'll be out in the soil. It's going to have to enter our host. And it's going to be an insect host. And again, there's a variety of insect hosts that, that could serve as a suitable host. Also kind of depends on like, what kind of insect host depends on the species and so forth. Um, but it's going to have to get into the insect host. How does it get there? So it can be consumed. All right, so it could be consumed. It could enter through the anus or the spiracles. What are the spiracles? The breathing opening. Yeah, the breathing opening. Gas exchange opening uh, on the abdomens. All right, so these Jower J3s aren't just sitting there. They can move, but they're in a, a state of low metabolism to increase their infectivity window. They get in to our host, where they go to the hemocele. All right, so they go to the hemocele, body cavity. All right, at this point, once they get into the body cavity, now they will release the bacteria. Bacteria will be in the hemocele, and these bacteria will replicate and increase in size and in number. And they're going to increase in number. Part of what they do is they release antibiotics because they're trying to prevent growth of other bacteria.
where did that, where did those other bacteria come from? The natural environment. How did it get into the hemocele? On the larva. So just when we have the nematodes, you're going to have bacteria on that cuticle. So the bacteria is going to be coming in with those, with those GD3s. All right, and the bacteria could produce an infection. We'll see some potentially secondary infection when we deal with hookworms that actually have to penetrate our skin and so forth. You don't want that to happen, or at least this bacteria doesn't want it to happen because that means it's going to be competing for the same food source, which is the hemocele and all the tissue inside that insect. Uh, and it, it's actually beneficial because it's going to give time for our nematode to develop and reproduce. So we get in here, this is all happening, and now it's going to provide a food source. This will be a food source for our nematode. Our J3 is going to molt, produce a J4. Gonna grow, molt, produces a J4. J4 will then molt to produce our adult. The adults are feeding. The adults reproduce. They will now release our egg, hatches to release our J1, molts to J2, molts to the J3, molts to the J4. All occurring inside of our host. And this happens for one to three generations. where we are just increasing population size of our nematodes. Eventually, some of these J2s will molt and develop into dour J3s. Still inside the host. And then it's gonna be these that will escape. Say release. Actually, instead of what I wrote release, I said escape. Escape's probably a little bit better term. Because what happens when they get released? They do. What happens to the host? Death of our host. Is it caused by the nematodes? No. It's the bacteria. And there's a lot of things that are, that are going on with this. So you've got your replication that's happening, the bacteria, you're getting an infection, a bigger and bigger and bigger infection. That's causing harm to the, to the host. It may be that they're feeding, and it just so happens that they hit a certain population size where they switch to the dour J3s, or they can actually sense the death of the insect, and that triggers molting into the dour J3s. Because these guys aren't really going to escape until that host dies, and then they're going to come out. So I don't want you to think that the release is what's causing the death of the host. Rather, the host dies, the dour J3s then come out. So this is how they're using it as a biological control. Not so much that uh, the worm itself is killing it, but it's the bacterium that they're transferring into those insects. Questions? All right.
So, how long does that insect have to live once they get infected? About 48 hours. About 48 hours is, is when uh, they'll get killed. All right, but not all insects are going to be killed because some of them just can't be infected. And that resistance just kind of depends on the ability of the insect to recognize and encapsulate the nematode. So if they can recognize it, uh, kind of get to them uh, before the bacterium emerges, or if they have an immune system that recognizes and kills the bacteria, hey, that's going to be good for that insect. And you, know, you won't see that insect as being a, a suitable host, or that species of insect as being a suitable host. Now, how... Since we do know that some insects can't be infected by the nematodes. Yep. So does this whole life cycle happen in the 48 hours? Uh -huh. Wow. That replication, yeah, you're one to three generations in that 40, 48 hours. And we say up to, up to three because that's probably the maximum that we're going to get. And then the insect's going to die. Yeah, very quick. And then you have the dower J3s. All right, so your infectivity for the insect kind of depends. It relies on that insect, uh, the immune system of that insect, which, yeah, inverts have, have immune. They, they have immune functions. So how does the worm evade that? Well, we, we know of two different methods of immune evasion. One is molecular mimicry. Molecular mimicry. All right, we encountered that term before. When did we encounter the term? What parasite species? Schistosoma. schistosoma. How did schistosoma produce this molecular mimicry? They did what? Yeah, they took in the glycolipids and then they re-expressed it on their surface. So that's one way that we could accomplish this molecular mimicry. The second way is, is likely what these nematodes do, which, which is the lipid layer of the cuticle is just very similar to the internal lipids of these insects. So the host doesn't recognize these lipids as being invaders. They're so similar, uh, they're so similar that, that they recognize it itself. And that you could argue that that is a, uh, they may have co-evolved together. This is a form of co-evolution. It's a, must be a long history uh, of association between the Steiner Nema species and the insect species, and so forth. So I provide the citation, Dunphy and Webster, 1986, if you're curious. Easy, just do uh, those two names, 1986 and probably Steiner Nema, and you, you, should, you should find it. So that's one method. The second method is immune suppression. All right, so you do have antibacterial uh, compounds that are at work trying to, to kill off those bacteria, the mutualists. All right, these worms, are going to secrete proteolytic enzymes that try to destroy those compounds. They try to break them down, prevent them from act acting. So that's going to help the bacterial symbiont survive. All right, It's going to help them survive, and if you can help them survive, then you're basically allowing your food source to increase so that you can then feed on it and, to, and replicate yourself. So this is more of like an indirect method. We hear about uh, proteolytic enzymes, or we had complement inhibition, uh, inhibition of complement pathway. That's like direct. This is more indirect. You're secreting these compounds to help the bacteria, which thus helps you. All right. And this enzyme is specific against the various host species. Again, arguing for why some of these they only exist in a couple species of insects. So specific. And again, arguing for this long history of uh, interaction. Long history of what? Biosis? Symbiosis? All right. Ready? So that's Steiner Nema. All right. Now we're going to switch orders to, to the Mermithidae. Order and family, family Mermithidae. Um, these individuals are only parasitic as juveniles. 
So you're going to have the adult as the free living stage. And what's important is that these worms have to escape. They have to get out of the host before they can become an adult. And when they do come out of the host, they typically kill the host. You could say that this probably served as at least one of the uh, models of alien and aliens. Right. Now, we do require water for further development and reproduction. And I'll note that we have another phylum of worms called the nematomorpha that has a similar life cycle pattern. Also dependent on water, although we, we are finding some species where they, they seem to be terrestrial nematomorphs. All right. um, I think if we have time, we cover the nematomorphs. Or at least we have a species presentation on, on Gordius. Um, and these worms, they can reach a fairly large size. This is one. Uh, Mermis nigrescens. Uh, that's our worm. Coming out of Tetagonia and Veridissima, which... Orthopteran, is that right? Grasshoppers, mm -hmm. focus. All right. So our adults are going to reproduce in water or moist environments. And the adults don't feed. They're going to rely on stored energy. So all of that energy that they acquire as a juvenile inside of that host, that's what they have to live on so that they can just find a mate reproduce, and then die. That energy source is probably lipids. That, that's probably what, what is being uh, used as stored energy. How do they do that? Well, they're going to do that by utilizing a trophosome. So as they develop, their intestines going to be modified into this food storage organ. So since you're not feeding anymore, there's no point in to keep it functional, where you're going to move food and digest it. You're going to hold it just to store this energy, uh, so that the adults can survive. Insect hosts that they infect, wide range of them. Um, insects are typical. So wide, wide range of arthropods. Just a wide range of arthropods. Insects are typical. Spiders and crustaceans, though, can also serve as a host depending on the species. So if you look at your arachnids, if you go to what you could say old world arachnids, or it's probably the, the westernized version of it, Middle Eastern areas, you're going to find a lot more of these myrmithids. Um, I think we only have one species here in North America. A lot of those, are like in uh, not just spiders, but scorpions. All right. Ready? All right, so the key features of this family, other than the trophosome, is that they possess a stickosome. We're going to see the stickosome appear in another, in another group, in whipworms and trichinella. All right, so the stickosome is a collection of glandular cells that surround the esophagus. So you've got your esophagus that runs as a tube, and then you're going to have these glandular cells that encircle it. Each of those glandular cells are called stickocytes. And then the collection of these stickocytes is called the stickosome. All right. In this group, you can have four, eight, or sixteen stickocytes. We're also going to see it in Trichura stricura, and in that, you're going to see we've got a lot more stickocytes in there because it's a much, much longer stickosome. Here's kind of a Comparison, so agamermis, that's your mouth opening, all right? You've got your very short esophagus, and your esophagus runs down. Each of these is the stickocyte, and then the entire region represents the stickosome. For comparison, we have trachyrus, which is our whipworm, really long esophagus, and you've got these stickocytes going all the way down. In our slide, they look kind of like Pan pancakes just stacked up. So the, the mermithids, they have this stickosome, just like whipworm. The juveniles also have a protrusible stylet. All right, we've encountered the term stylet 
uh, or you may have encountered it in our trematodes, because some of our cercaria have stylets. The stylets probably used in penetration of the host. All right. Get into the insect and to burrow into the body cavity. Some of our free-living nematodes also have stylets. We have three main life cycle types. We've got an aquatic life cycle, which we'll, we'll use uh, Roman, uh, Romana mermis, Pulisivorax, as our example. And then we have two different terrestrial cycles. So we've got a pattern one and a pattern two. We'll, we'll distinguish between the two patterns, but we're only going to give a uh, representative life cycle for pattern one, which is mermis and resin. All right. So we've got the sickosome, we've got trophosome, and the adult. Ready to move on? Romano mermis culisivorax. All right, so family mermithidae, this is our aquatic life cycle. Uh, we're going to present this one, Romano mermis culisivorax, because it is used as a biological control agent against mosquitoes. Is it still being used? Probably. Uh, it was marketed as this mosquito doom, right? utilizing biology to control biology. So we're going to present the life cycle up on the board. A couple terms that we're going to introduce. Stigma tactic, which is uh, you know, it's a form of taxis. It's, it's being drawn to touch. So it's going to favor being in contact with something. Uh, and then transcuticular uptake. Uh, this is basically where you're absorbing nutrients through the cuticle, which is somewhat unusual. But it's going to be the primary mode of nourishment for the J3s in this stage. All right. So, let us mute it and do our example life cycle. And should be able to should be able to get it on this side of the board. Right. Oops. Where's my cursor? All right. The man of rumors, human All right, so I think what we will do is start with our adults. All right, our adults are non feeding. going to be in our substrate they're going to be in our substrate of our pond so this is an aquatic life cycle so we're going to be in an area where we have our insect host which will be mosquito larva so our adults are in the substrate they're non-feeding all right they're going to find each other they're going to reproduce and they're going to release eggs going to release eggs. And it takes about seven to ten days for them to mate, reproduce, and start producing the eggs. Inside the eggs, we will have development of the J1, and that J1 will molt into the J2 stage. All right, and that all happens inside of our egg. And then our egg will hatch and release that J2. All right. These eggs are desiccation resistant. So they can withstand drying out, and that's probably a good thing because in a lot of these temporary bodies of water, it's going to dry up, and then you're going to get rain, spring rains, it's going to fill up, and it's going to be 
provide a, a, a breeding site for mosquitoes. So these eggs remain in that area until it fills up with water, and the water is going to trigger hatching. So they don't hatch when they're dry. They're only going to hatch when water is present. So that's why we say it's, it's water-dependent hatching. These J2s are very short-lived. Right, they're very short-lived. They're going to be temperature-dependent. So at 30 degrees, which is probably the temperature of a lot of ponds around here in July and August, 30 degrees Celsius, these guys live less than a day. And that's how long they have to find a host. At 2 degrees, which is colder than your fridge, normally fridge temperature is at 4 degrees Celsius. At 2 degrees, they can only live 2 days. And that's unusual, because normally if you put things in the fridge, you can make them last for months. Not so with these guys. All right? So they're going to be very short-lived. And they have that time available to find and penetrate the cuticle of our host. And our host, mosquito larvae. That's our host. So if they're short-lived, so these guys are short-lived, how do they accomplish this? How do they find their host? A couple different things. Negatively geotaxis, or geotactic. All right, so they're swimming against the earth, against the ground, against gravity. Try to get them up into the water column. Why? Because that's where the mosquito larvae are. All right, so they're negative geotactic. They're positively thigmotactic. And that's they prefer to be in contact and touching things. So they're going to try to get to some of this vegetation, this floating vegetation. Why the floating vegetation? It's because that's providing a uh, surface on which algae can grow. Algae and bacteria. They, the, anything that grows on a sub surface like that is called the offlux community because it's composed of algae and diatoms and bacteria and all that stuff. That's a food source of mosquitoes, of the mosquito larvae. So we've got two things going for it already to try to increase the chance that they contact mosquito larvae. But then you have this other thing, the amphids. They may secrete some form of attractant. So you get there, maybe that's not enough, but there's some suggestions that these amphids that are sensory, chemosensory, but they also have some secretory function. If you go back to that, that uh, intro to the nematode stuff, they may be secreting an attractant that if a mosquito larvae senses it, they get attracted to it, and now our J2 can contact and penetrate that larvae by going through the cuticle. They don't get consumed, but they feel, get onto that cuticle, they sense that they're on the cuticle, they start using that stylet to start scraping to get through that cuticle and into the host. All right, so we penetrate the cuticle into our mosquito larvae, J2s develop. into the J3 stage, all right? And this happens very quickly. Why does it need to happen very quickly? Mosquito larvae will become mosquitoes. You know how quickly? Uh, over the summer, we're probably at about five days from eggs sit in the water to when adult mosquitoes will come out. It's temperature dependent. You could say an average is about 10 days. So, yeah, when, you have, when we have rainfall and you've got standing water, you don't have a whole lot of time to, to take care of it. Mosquitoes get there. All right? So these things are going to do this very rapidly. And they're going to retain the cuticle. They're going to retain that J2 cuticle when they do this. All right. 
So the J2s, they're going to grow, they're going to enlarge very rapidly. So I should say. Rapid enlargement. They will molt to the J3, retain that cuticle. And when they do that, they will cause the host to die. Here, rupture and kill the host. Rupture and kill the host. That's how they get out. And then we're going to shed that J2 cuticle. Molt, whoops, shed molt to the J4. I'm gonna have to double check this. I believe that's it. We had some conflicting information. I think this is it. We'll leave it as is. But we get out of the host with the J4. J4s now are gonna be the ones that burrow into the substrate and molt into our adult stage. Burrow into substrate and molt. What's our timing? Rupture in the host. It takes about seven to eight days post infection. We're going to use averages. So, from the time the mosquito larvae gets infected to when they emerge, about seven to eight days. So, your larval stages, they're feeding. They're feeding. Stage that isn't are the adults. Adults are going to get out there. They're going to uh, mate, start laying eggs. Takes about a week to do that. So this is why they're, they use it as a biological control agent. In order to get out, you're going to kill the mosquito larvae. You get them out there, you can treat it. How effective is it? My guess is not super effective or else we would be using it every place. Questions? Is the mosquito larvae the dependent host? Well, there's no, like, that's not where There's no, yeah. So it's intermediate host. I would, well, I would just say it host. is the host. Okay. The one host. I think the definitive host, intermediate host, is used when you have multiple host life cycles. As you say, this is our host. Mosquito is the host. And that's why we kind of present this. Because th this is a case where the adult isn't the infect isn't the, the parasite. It's the larval stage. And it's required. If without the mosquito larvae, they don't develop. That's it. So, all right. So I think what we'll do is end it there. Um, we've got one more life cycle available for the inverts, and then we'll switch to vertebrate hosts. And I think the first one we address is trick yours. So you know, let's stick a sight one. All right. Uh, don't forget, in lab, we have nematode presentations. So we already picked the dates. Make sure you double check when you're presenting, because we're going to be doing that on Monday. All right. Let's pass back these exams.